Thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed today's service. God is using the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in many people's lives, and we have heard numerous stories of life change. If God has used the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in your life, we would love to hear your story. Please email us at amen at lakesidechurch.ca. So we've been talking about the table over the last couple of weeks, and we've been talking about the importance of gathering around the table. We said that around the table, it's where those memories get made that last a lifetime with the people that are closest to us. It's around the table where we share our stories, and as we share, there's times of laughter, but sometimes when we share our stories, there's times of tears as well. It's around the table where our identity gets established, where we get that sense of worth and that sense of value and that sense of meaning and that sense of like, we matter. It is around the table where our faith gets strengthened, especially around you know, things like the small group table or the study table or the solid rock cafe table. It's around the table where parents pass values and principles and guidelines from one generation to the other. It happens around the table. It's around the table that when I come with a dilemma or a decision that others who are wise around the table will share with me and help impart wisdom. It's around the table where relationships get strengthened and conflict gets sorted out and it's, it's where we can be vulnerable and transparent. It's around the table. And Jesus knew the importance of gathering around the table. Jesus was often found eating and drinking with others around the table and sometimes they were people that were kind of outcast or they were outliers in their culture. They were tax collectors and sinners. Sometimes they were his disciples. Sometimes they were religious leaders. But Jesus was often uh, found eating and drinking around the table. It's just who he was. And it was his table manners and often who he ate with that brought about the greatest criticism. And some believe it's what led to his crucifixion. The table, you see, is equated with closeness and intimacy and deep relationships. And we've talked about the importance of the table. And for the next three weeks today and two weeks after this, we're going to look at three specific tables. Next week, we're going to talk about the family table. It's Youth Sunday. And our youth, some of our youth teachers are going to teach here in Lakeside Downtown. We're going to have our youth bands and all of those kind of things. Great Sunday. Youth Sunday is always a special one. And we're going to talk about the family table. And the week after that, we're going to talk about the table and the world around us, the culture around us. Because, and, and at that week, we're going to look at how do we find a place at the table, sit at the table with people we disagree with, and even we have differences of opinion, or um, how do we get around the table? That's what we're going to talk about on the, uh, in the week after that. But today, we're going to talk about the whole idea of the church community table. The church community table. When Jesus was kind of at, he was at the turning point of his ministry. And at the turning point of his ministry, he kind of takes a poll. And he gathers his closest followers and he says, hey, what's the word on the street? Who do people say that I am? And his closest followers say, hey, some people think you're a prophet, like one of those Old Testament prophets. Some say, they've got you confused with your cousin, John the Baptist. Others say, well, you're a great teacher, or you're a great moral thinker, or you're a man of great character, or you're a very wise person. That's the word on the street. You know, it's interesting, the opinions of Jesus then are not different from now. Lots of people will give Jesus uh, you know, sort of the, the time of day and say, oh yeah, Jesus was a great teacher, great moral person. You know, he was a healer, he loved people. But then Jesus asked the question of his closest followers, those who had been eyewitnesses to his teaching and his miracles and his interaction with people. He says, who do you say I am? What do you think? And Peter jumps in because he was impetuous and he says, you are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are the Christ. You are, and then he says these words, you are the son of the living God. The son of the living God. See, I think the closer you get to Jesus, the more you understand his identity. And they were the eyewitnesses and they understood and Jesus responds after that is said with what, some of the most important words that he spoke. And he says this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He says, and I tell you, Peter, because Peter got the answer right, on this rock, he's not, you know, he used to play on words because Peter's name means rock. He's not talking about Peter. He's talking about the rock of what he just declared, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. On this rock, I will build my church. He says, I will be the builder of my church. You don't have to worry about building it, I'll do it. 
And he says, then the gates of Hades, the abode of the dead, will not overcome it. What he is saying here, he says, I'm going to build my church and it will be an unstoppable force if it's the kind of church that I build. If it's the kind of church that I build. And just like God said to Abraham, we saw this a few weeks in Genesis 12, he said to Abraham, I want you to, I'm going to make you a chosen community, and out of this community, the world is going to be impacted, the world is going to be blessed. And Jesus is saying the same thing as God said way back to Abraham, he's now saying to his followers, I'm going to build a new community, this new community is going to be called the church, and this church is going to have an influence and impact on the rest of the world. And this is kind of, in this, and you, you almost feel this sort of Martin Luther kind of speech, where Jesus says, I have this dream, and I have this dream of this thing called the church where people will gather together and worship and pray and they will love one another, and they will care for one another, and they will sort out their differences, and the veterans will sort of pour into the rookies, and people will sh uh, share their gifts with one another, and they will com compassionately care for one another, and that's the kind of community I'm going to build. And when that kind of community gets built, nothing will stop it. It will be an unstoppable force. Now, Jesus kind of uses a unique word here. When he uses this word church, and the, uh, the Second Testament, or the New Testament part of the Bible, is written in the Greek language. And the word in Greek for the word church that he uses is a unique word. It's ekklesia. It's ekklesia. And there were many ekklesias in that day. It's not like he's introducing a brand new concept. Because the ecclesia simply meant a gathering of people who have been called to make a difference in the affairs of the state. They are a group of called people who are called to make a difference in the affairs of the state. And Jesus is saying, I will build my ecclesia, my church, my gathering of people who are called, and they will make a difference or they will have an influence in the affairs of people in the world around them. He says, I will build my church. Jesus was not talking about a building program to raise funds and you know, put up a structure. Because the church, the ecclesia, was not a building it was a group of people, it was a gathering of people called to make a difference and have an impact in their world. And the best definition for this word ecclesia is a gathering of called ones to make a difference. It is a gathering, the church is a gathering of people. And the early church, if this word was translated into English, they would have read this verse like this. And on this rock I will build my gathering, my gathering of people, the called ones. That's how they would have read it. It wasn't until the 1400s to this word kirk, which meant the house of the Lord got inserted here and the word church was added. And the kirk was this idea of a place or a destination or a structure. But that wasn't the meaning that Jesus had. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to build my structure. He said, I'm going to build this group of people who are going to make a difference in the world. And we have lost what the church means. We see it as a structure. We see it as a destination. Jesus said it's not that. It's a gathering of people called to make a difference. And Jesus had this mission that these people would gather together and they would make a difference. And he, he said that you'll know who my church people are, my gathering are, because they're going to be marked. And he says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all people, everyone will know. Everyone will know because this is the single mark of my followers, my disciples, my church, my gathering. What will mark them is that they love one another. Jesus said there's going to be one mark that marks the church, and it's going to be love. And it's going to be the way they love God, and it's going to be the way they love others, and it's going to be the way they love people outside of the gathering. Love will be the mark, and it'll be such a radical kind of love. It'll be a godlike kind of love. It'll be a love that's patient and a love that's kind and a love that's not envious or not proud or rude. It is unconditional, no strings attached, forgiving, not self-seeking kind of love. He said, that's the mark. And when the church is marked by love and it demonstrates love, a love for God and a love for others and a love for those outside the gathering, that's going to be an unstoppable force. Now somehow, somewhere along the way, we lost this. For the first 300 or so years, the church was marked by love. But then for about the next 15 or 1600 years, the love was replaced by power. And the church thought that they would control and influence the world by power. And they used guilt and manipulation and they ruled by rules of religion and ritual. And for hundreds of years, it ruled by power. And that lasted for so long, but things changed. And a day came, and it's not so long ago, that they lost their power. And so they began to be ruled by criticism and judgment of the culture, of the people outside of the gathering. 
And I believe that the church today too often is known about what they're against instead of knowing what they're for. And they're for love. And I think it's time the church gets marked by love, the kind of love that Jesus talked about. Because no one will criticize a church because it loves too much. And no one will mock a church because of how loving the people are. And no one will say negative things about the church if they love their community in tangible, practical ways. Nobody will have anything negative to say. The criticism of the church is not because of the way it loves. It's the way it's become critical and judgmental and uses power and become exclusive. That's why the criticism comes. And Jesus said, my church will be marked by love and it'll be marked by one other thing. He says this, I, Jesus is talking about himself, I in them and you, he's talking about God the Father, in me. May they be brought to complete unity. May they be a unified community to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even as you have loved them. He said, when they are marked by love and they are marked by unity, the world will know, people will know that there's a relationship between these called ones and the one who is called. And Jesus loved the church, we are told. So much so that we're told by one writer, Paul, says that he gave his life for the church, this gathering people. And if he lo- a church that would be marked by love and marked by unity would make a difference. And because of his love because of his love for the church, and I believe because of his love for the table, I think Jesus believes the best place for the church to gather around is the table. The table. Yes, we have developed this system of sitting in rows, except for some of you. But I think Jesus' design was eventually the community would get around the table. And not, not long after Jesus said, I will build my church, and then he died on a cross for that church, and he rose again, and then he ascended into heaven. His early, earliest followers are gathered in a room around the table. And they're waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. And they're praying, come Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit shows up in this incredible way. And fired up by the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter gets up. Once again, as Peter. He's the first guy on his feet. And he gives this sermon. And it is so life-changing that 3,000 people go, we choose Jesus. We want to be one of his followers. 3,000 people. And in Acts 2, 42 to 47, we read about that first gathering of followers. This is what it says. And they were devoted. They stuck like glue themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship. You know, when they talk about the apostles' teaching here, they're talking about, you know, one of the followers of Jesus who was an eyewitness of Jesus would gather with them, and he would teach. And to the fellowship, it's this idea of getting together. It's deeper than just having a cup of tea after church in the cafe. Fellowship was much deeper. It was a much deeper connection. They would have this connection. There would be the breaking of bread. This is um, what we might call communion or the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. Whatever church background you come from, this is that. They gathered to break bread, and they were gathered for prayer. It said that everyone, this is everybody outside the community, was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles, the early church leaders. All those, you know, followers, the gathered ones, were together. They had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added daily to their number of those who are being saved. Awesome, awesome picture of this first gathering. And I just kind of want to look at this and kind of take it apart for just a few moments. You see... It says they were devoted. They stuck to like glue. They stuck like glue. They were perseverant. They hung in there. And they devoted themselves to this teaching. They found their way to where there was great teaching. Teaching that would be of what Jesus taught. And they would have one of their church leaders teach what Jesus taught because he had been around Jesus. And they would share it. And they would talk about it. And they would interact. And they would discuss and apply And they devoted themselves to that fellowship, right? That connection, that deep connection, much deeper than just hanging out with each other. And they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, to the Eucharist, to communion, whatever. And they devoted themselves to prayer. The community gathered to prayer. And and we look at this verse, and we look at it through our lens of 2,000 years of church history. And we have learned to take these things and take them apart. 
And so we say, oh yeah, we come Sunday morning in other environments and we have teaching. And then we have fellowship and we do that in other environments. And then we have the breaking of bread and that kind of is a, a separate thing in itself. And then we have prayer and that's separate. And we have learned to separate those. And in our minds, we think that way because that's our practice 2,000 years later. But here's the reality. This was not separated in that day. All of this happened in the same gathering around the same table because they would gather together on Sunday night and that they would have a meal together and it would be a meal of unleavened bread and fish and cheese and figs and vegetables and there would be some wine that was what they drank in that day and they would do life together and they would gather around this table and someone would teach at some point you know, someone who knew Jesus would teach about Jesus, and then they would pray, and then they would have this thing called the, the bread and the wine, and in the end, they would take a piece of bread, and they would take some wine, and they would remind themselves of what Jesus had done for them on the cross, died to pay the price for their sin, died so that they could be free. They were reminded around this table, and we know this is how it was because it said they did this in their homes. You see... There are two tables here, the front. We'll call this the communion table, and we'll call this the community table. And these two tables were in that day not separate tables. Over the last 2,000 years, we have separated these tables, and we've turned them into vastly different experiences. And on one side, we have this communion table, or the Eucharist, and sometimes we call it an altar, and it's where we remember in a service the death and resurrection of Jesus. And it's an awesome thing, and we need to celebrate that. But then we have this community table, but we've turned this community table into something that it wasn't ever really intended. It's now just kind of hanging out and having a meal and a cup of tea or whatever, potluck dinner in the church I grew up with. They had lots of those. And we separated these two tables, but they were never separated in that day. And they can't be separated because what is enacted and what is celebrated and what is the symbolism of this table has to be integrated with this community table. The communion table cannot be dissected or distant from the community table because it's at this table that we're reminded of God's grace and we're reminded of God's forgiveness and we're reminded of God's goodness and we're reminded of his love and his acceptance no matter what we've done and we're reminded of his sacrifice and we're reminded of so many wonderful truths of God and his love for us at this communion table. Grace being that most dominant thing that we're reminded of. And at that table, and all we're reminded here, we've got to take to this table. And everything that's at this table has to be here. There has to be grace and love and forgiveness and mercy and sacrifice. They were never intended to be separate. They were never intended to be separate. This table and the celebration of this table must influence what goes on in the community table. This table has to influence this table, or this table is just a shallow substitute of what the early church practiced. And so these two tables are not separate. They're one. And we read in this section of Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47, some of the things that took place at that table. And I just kind of want to briefly net those out today. The first thing that we find that happened at that table is the word connection. We see that there was connection at the table. And we've looked at this verse a couple of times now. They devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to what? Fellowship. To fellowship. The Greek word is koinonia. And it's more than just getting together. It's about being closely connected. It's where our lives and our stories interwine with one another or interwoven with one another. We share our stories and we share our struggles and we share what's happening in our lives and we share our um, good moments and not so good moments and we laugh together and cry together and do life together. We get connected around the table. We inter. Uh, sort of we interact with each other, we participate in each other's lives. We are companions to one another. It's doing life together. It's around this table that I love others and they love me. It's around the community table that I get known. People know who I am and I get to know them. It's where we celebrate and we're celebrated. It's where we cry and mourn with one another. It's around this table. And I believe we live in a world that is hungry for the kind of connection that this table belongs. Um, denotes it's a place to belong it's a place to connect it's a place to matter and grow and to change it's a place to be like family that's why the early writers of the letters john peter james paul 
all use this family idea when they talk about this gathering of people, that they would be like a family. Because that's what the connection is to be like. And yes, in like all families, there's some dysfunctionality in the church community family. They're just there. And we live in a culture so loosely connected and believe they're better connected because of technology. But they really are. But they're longing for a deeper connection. And I believe it happens around the table. All of us long for this place to connect. And it happens around the community table. That's why the communion table has to influence the community table. The second thing was unity. There was unity around this table. It said all the believers were what? Together. Together in mind and spirit. And they had everything in common. There was a unity around the table. They were experiencing the unity that Jesus prayed for before he went to the cross. Father, make them one as you and I are one. Here's the important thing. Unity is not the same as uniformity. They are two different things. Uniformity is being forced to be the same. And that's been the problem of the church for far too long. That everyone has to be the same. Everyone has to be a clone. Everyone has to fit into a mold. I watched churches and actually attended one where they wanted everyone to dress the same and talk the same and act the same and look the same. And it was kind of like I called it the Stepford Wives Church. But that's not unity. That's not what he's calling for. Unity is the harmonizing of diversity over mission and purpose. Jesus said the mark of the church would be love and the mission of the church would be to love God and to love each other and to love the community, the greater community. He said that's our mission and that's what we're unified around. And we bring people with diverse gifts and abilities, perspectives and temperament and personality and we unify them around a mission. You never force anyone to be in unity. Unity is something I choose to be in because of the mission. And sometimes there is conflict in the community table. See, community, genuine community is not the absence of conflict. It is the presence of a reconciling spirit, the willingness to work it out for the sake of the mission. And when we lose sight of the mission, that it's about loving God and loving each other and loving the, those outside of the gathering, when we lose sight of the mission, we take our eyes off of that, we put our eyes on ourselves. And it's about what I want. And it's about my agenda and my desires. And church becomes a place we consume. That wasn't Jesus' purpose. Jesus said, no, take all this diversity and harmonize it together with their gifts and abilities. i got to tell you, the community table would be a boring table if we were all the same. It would be. And what kills unity at this table is when we talk behind each other's backs, when we gossip and plot, and when we say unkind and untrue things. Unity is about setting aside my way for the sake of our way. It's moving from a me mindset to a we mindset. Unity takes a humble spirit because it's a willingness to surrender for the sake of the mission. The third thing around this table, and all of us need this from time to time, it's compassion. We need compassion. It says this, they sold their possessions and goods and they gave to anyone, anyone who had what? A need. Compassion is giving to those who have a need. And when we sit around the community table, sometimes we share our stories. And there are stories that aren't fun stories. They're stories of struggle. They're stories of sorrow, of need, of hurt, of woundedness. We get around the table and we share our story. And it's around that table we hurt together and cry together and mourn together and we do life together. You know, the word compassion means to come alongside someone. It's the calm part. The passion is the idea, the passion of the Christ. It's emotions and, and, and physical hurts and wounds. It's about being wounded and broken. That's what passion meant. It's to walk alongside, it's walking alongside with people who are hurting and are wounded. And that's what the table is all about. It's about this table where we care, care for one another in the most difficult and challenging times in life. And sometimes it requires sacrifice. Sometimes it requires me giving up my time or my stuff or whatever to care for the needs of others. But it's around this table that we need compassion. And life gets hard sometimes. And we need a place where others will walk the journey with us. And that's what you get around the community table. Next, you get encouragement and hope. Encouragement and hope says this, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, that is daily gatherings in the courtyard of the temple, and they would sing and they kind of do service thing and they probably stood in rows. 
And then they broke bread in their homes. And they ate together with glad, glad hearts. It's around this table that we build one another up and we encourage one another and we say positive things to one another in encouraging ways. I was at a conference this week. It was a secular conference on mental health and addiction. And one of the speakers, actually from Canada, talked about a step-by-step -step process of bringing recovery and preventing relapse. And he had this nine-point process. And he said the most important things for recovery and relapse is encouragement and hope. I'd already prepared this talk, or a lot of it. And I thought, he's right. If we want to help ourselves and help each other when we're going through the most difficult times, we need encouragement and hope. You know, we need to encourage those who are struggling, say, you know, with God's help, you can get through this. We need to encourage that, hey, that goal or dream you have, you can do that. You can handle these circumstances you're encountering. You can go through these difficult times. You can, it's going to be great. We encourage and build up one another, and we give each other hope. You know, the word glad here means joy or to rejoice, but it's got this word picture, and it's about people singing and dancing. It's about going to your favorite party and having an awesome time. That's what a glad heart is. And that's what we do around the table. We encourage. We give hope. We get glad hearts. Next. We're honest around the table. We're honest. This is a hard part for many of us. It says this, you know, they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Now the word sincere is an interesting word. It means to be without wax. Sin without uh, wax, serous, serous wax. Without wax is what it means. And in the ancient Near East, these, these potters, you know, were very, and they were very um, a, a profitable business, and, and they would take pots and bowls. Everything was, you know, pottery in those days. That's all they had to kind of do, uh, create these, what they ate out of and drank out of. And the potters would take a pot or a bowl, and they would fire it into a kiln, and sometimes it would come out of the kiln and it would have a crack in it. And what really good, honest potters would do is they'd throw it and break it up and they'd use the broken pieces of pottery for other things. But what a kind of shady potters would do is they would look at that and they didn't want to really start all over again and so they would get some wax and they would put it in the crack and then they would paint over it. Uh, they, would be called, they would be called insincere potters because they had wax. Sincerity was without wax. And, and what they're saying is, is that to be sincere is that what is beneath the surface is available for everyone to see. It's available to everyone to see. The word sincere is, let's, is, is about letting people see what's going on beneath the surface. It's about being transparent and vulnerable and honest. It's the opposite to hiding. And yet we have turned in our culture an art form into mask wearing. And we pretend and we protect and we hide and we never get real and honest and transparent. And I'm going to tell you, you want real freedom from the struggles of life, you've got to take the mask off and let others see what's going on. And I think that the strongest community I've seen exist is in the recovery community because they get real and they get honest and they take off their mask and there's this connection and bond. It's around the community table where we need to establish trust. And you got to do that first. And then you share a little bit of what's beneath the surface. And when you get sort of accepted and appreciated and people kind of walk with you, you go, okay, I can share a little bit more and a little more until we become, the mask gets peeled right back. We start with a little crack of the mask and eventually get to the whole deal. And i got to say, women, you do this way better than we men. But all of us, we need to get around a table where we get honest because you want freedom. You want support you want help, you got to get real. And it can be scary. But we will never be free until we're fully known. And we're never fully known until we get honest with one another. And then the last point. The last point is this. All are welcome around the table. All are welcome. That's what it says. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added daily to their number, those who were being saved. You see, I think what happened is in those days, people saw everything happening in this gathering and went, wow, look at these people gathering around these tables. Look at the mark of love and how they love one another. Look at the life change. Look at the compassion. Look at the unity. Look at the difference it's making in their lives. Look at the freedom they're finding as they get real. We want some of that. And I think those people then, as they said, we want some of that, we're saying, hey, join our table. The table is not just for saints. 
where there's got to be plenty of room at the table for sinners. Jesus invited outcasts and outliers and strangers and the broken and the wounded and the worst of society to his tables. And everybody needs to be able to pull up a chair in the community table in a couple weeks. That's what we're really going to talk about. And this has to be a welcoming table. We create space for all to sit. Because when we get to sit at the table, that's where lives change. That's where lives change. You see, in Greek language, <coughs> there's no punctuation. So this period would not actually be there. And I think the period created a misunderstanding of what this means. See, I think what happens is that all the people were invited to gather around the table, and they, in, they had glad and sincere hearts. And when they belonged around the table, when they belonged, then guess what happened? They chose to believe. See, we for so long in the church said, believe all the right things and then you can belong with us. I think that's backwards. I think this verse says that's backwards. I think that we need to belong and then we believe. I think we belong in community and connect and then we choose to believe, not the other way around. <coughs> the table is for everyone. And we need to be able to find our place around the table all of us, whether saint or sinner. This is not an exclusive table. It's a table that Jesus would set and say, everybody's welcome. Everyone's welcome, and that's hard. Because over the years, the church has said, oh, no, 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 no. Only certain people are allowed around the table. Others, mm -mm, clean up your act, get it all sorted out, be right, fly right, then maybe... Jesus said different. No, no. Come on to my table. Everybody. Because in that belonging with others in community, I think it'll affect your believing. See, the church community table is one of those critical tables. And yeah, we sit on rows on Sunday, but we've got to find ourselves, friends, around tables with one another in community. And we need to learn how to slow life down. Some of us can't, so that's why some of us will never get around the table. We're too busy. We've got to learn to slow life down. And when we get around the table, you know, we stop being so task-oriented that so many of us are caught up in, and we become more people-oriented. And around the table, we do life together, and we grow together, and we change together, and we hurt together, and we connect together, and we get honest together, and we shape each other's lives together, and we love together, and we do mission together, and we laugh and cry together, and it happens around the table. Genuine community is not built by sitting in rows. It's by sitting around the table in circles. See, this is where ecclesia happens. This is where the church gets built. It's around the table. And sometimes they're formal tables, like small group tables and solid rock cafe tables and other group tables and ministry tables. Sometimes they're men's and women's ministry tables. Sometimes they're formal. Sometimes they're just informal. We just gather with people in community around the table. That's what we've been pushing this entire series. Because when we're the ecclesia, when we are the chosen ones around the table, we will be the church that Jesus dreamed of. And when we're the kind of church that Jesus dreams of, it's an unstoppable force. The, 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 the inspiration to impact our world comes through prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. But the motivation and the push comes from the table. That's why we gather. And if the church is ever going to be who Jesus wants it to be, it's got to find its way around the table and be this kind of table to one another. It will change the game in such a radical way. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, I just thank you that you loved us so much and that you, you had this design for a community called the church and it was to be a gathering, not a building or a destination. And I pray that this will be that kind of gathering that we'll learn better to get to the table and hang around the table and encourage one another and build one another up and, and that we will be unified and that we'll be compassionate and we'll have fellowship. We'll do all those things around the table because, Lord God, we all need that kind of connection. All of us dearly long for it. The depth of connection is found around this table. And may we be motivated to do whatever it takes to find our way to the table. 
And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this message. To hear it again or other messages, please visit us at lakesidechurch.ca.